Welcome to this special event uh, in the University of Edinburgh uh, under the title On the Centenary of the British Mandate in Palestine, a Palestinian Address to Lord Balfour. My name is Hugh Goddard and I'm an honorary professor in the Al-Walid Centre uh, on George Square. Very pleased to be chairing this event this afternoon and uh, my own academic expertise is in the field of Christian-Muslim relations so I'm hoping that my experience of dealing with difficult issues in inter-religious relations will be pertinent uh, in dealing with difficult issues in the political uh, arena this afternoon. Though there is, of course, a significant religious dimension to the question we're looking at this afternoon uh, as well. Just a word about the format uh, of the event. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Salman Abu Sitta, will be speaking for about 45 minutes and we hope that that will allow about half an hour for comments and questions and discussion. The event is being recorded, so please be aware of that. And can I ask, therefore, that everyone uh, listens, as well as perhaps wishing to speak, and if they speak, then you speak carefully and respectfully of the discussion that we will be holding. I'm reminded of the Gallic proverb that sits on the outside of the Scottish Parliament that says, say little and say it well. I hope that can be the spirit of our discussion uh, this afternoon. Now, there are a number of organisers uh, of the event this afternoon. Uh, the lead organisers are Race.ed, uh, a cross-university network of over 70 academics concerned with race, racialisation and decolonial studies from a multidisciplinary perspective, and the Kenyan Institute in Jerusalem, which together with its <coughs> companion institute in Amman, uh, make up the Council for British Research in the Lebanon, CBRL. Uh, which as well as working in Jordan, Palestine and Israel, also works in Syria, Lebanon and Cyprus. Now there are a number of other co-sponsors, uh, the Routledge Journal Identities, Global Studies in Culture and Power, it's edited by Professor Nasser Mir of the University of Edinburgh and Dr. Aaron Winter of the University of Lancaster. Uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies in the Humanities here in Edinburgh the Centre for Research Collections in the University Library, the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies, the Department uh, or School of History, the Department of Sociology, and the Politics and International <coughs> Relations Middle East Research Group. So there are a whole range of sponsors of the event across different parts of the university. And it's obviously not going to be possible for all of them to tell us about their work. But before I introduce our speaker, I do want to give an opportunity to the two lead organisers to say a few words about the rationale and the background to this event. The two main organisers being Dr. Shara Vadasaria of Race Ed, the Associate Director of Race Ed, and then Dr. Tafik Haddad, the Director of the Kenyan Institute. So, uh, Shaira and Tafik, the floor is yours. Okay, so good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Dr. Shaira Vanasaria, and I'm a co director of Race Ed alongside uh, Dr. Katusha Bento, who's in the room somewhere, I can't see. Um, and also a lecturer in, in race and decolonial studies. Uh, thank you, Professor Goldard, for chairing this event and for really taking the time with us to understand its genesis and, and its vision. Um, and I'd just like to echo the thank you to our co-sponsors for supporting this event um, and the broader intellectual resonance of addressing this particular occasion. The multi-sponsorship on this event, both locally here at the University of Edinburgh um, and with the Jerusalem branch of the Council for British Research in the Levant is an encouraging sign that we can and indeed are holding difficult conversations about institutional entanglements within colonial legacies of violence, racial and otherwise, past and present. 
with Palestine as no exception to this conversation. And so let me acknowledge here that um, although the organizing of this event has not come without its challenges, um, our ability to hold space for Palestine in this way today and with our esteemed speaker, Dr. Salman Abusitta, um, is only possible because of long, hard struggles and sacrifices made within the community and its allies elsewhere, of course, and within Palestine, where the stakes and the scales of freedom struggles are simply much higher. I think a lot of us here within the university, a lot of us here within the University of Edinburgh community, and certainly within the Race Ed Network, are asking ourselves, well, what does it mean to inhabit and even serve institutions whereby the histories of imperial and colonial rule are still very much alive? And this is certainly the case in present-day Palestine, where the afterlife of British imperialism made possible an ongoing structure of settler colonialism today. Raced's intent behind this lecture is a modest one, an invitation to bring community together, many of us, many of whom are working directly in the study of colonialism, race, and decoloniality, whatever this means, as we're trying to figure out, uh, both at the level of theory but also community praxis and to think about the legacy of Balfour from Palestine, so to speak. And so it is in this context that we thought it was a special and it was a rare occasion to invite a Dr. Salman Abu Sitta, um, who today is one of the oldest living scholars of Palestine. As the leading cartographer of return, uh, your contributions to both the field at large and the wider Palestinian movement is one that carries with it unwavering radical optimism and a kind of pragmatic planning, the combination of both, um, that resonates across intergenerational life. And uh, through your work, Dr. Salman, we are invited to understand um, not only a kind of geographical form of, of repair, but, um, but a, to think about return as a signifier of broader claims to justice in Palestine and the possibility of a Palestinian futurity. So it is in this particular and wider context that we extend our utmost gratitude to our esteemed speaker of tonight, Dr. Salman, who um, graciously traveled a great distance to be here with us today. Um, and let me also thank Dr. Tofik Haddad, who I'll pass the mic to momentarily, um, who's also been at the fore of co-constructing this event and who himself has traveled directly from Palestine to be here with us today. The distances traveled for this occasion, both geographically, but also affectively or emotionally, cannot and should not be taken for granted. For reasons that will surely come to be known through your lecture, Dr. Salman, uh, your willingness to speak with us at the University of Edinburgh on the centenary of British mandates uh, in Palestine in light of what these forms of colonial rule um, came to mean in your own life as a, as a life in exile, is an enormous act of generosity. And so please let me just start by acknowledging this and uh, thanking you for making this journey here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see so many people here. My name is Tofik Haddad, and I'm the director of the Jerusalem branch of the Council for British Research in the Levant, also known <coughs> as the Kenyan Institute. Today is a special occasion for our organization because it comes in a context of a wider series of lectures that we have planned around the issue of the centenary of the British mandate in Palestine which we have planned for throughout the course of the fall. In fact, this is actually the fourth lecture that we have planned, loosely organized around key dates in this period, uh, with this actual event 
attempting to loosely coincide with the issuance of the Balfour Declaration, which took place on the 2nd of November, and with some of the other events taking place around the issuance of the partition plan on the 29th of November, as well as commemoration of the Arab Revolt in October 1936. I welcome you to check out our website to see some of those events and to see what is future planned. Allow me for a moment to speak to this series and its genesis. Not because I wish to highlight the activities of my organization per se, but because walking around a place like Edinburgh and the United Kingdom, after coming from a place like Jerusalem and the Sheikh Al Rah neighborhood, where the Kenyan Institute is currently located, it is clear that the legacy of British colonialism is ever present. We see it in the buildings, in the monuments, and the high, relatively stable, prosperous existence that exists here. Noticeably absent is any commemoration of the legacy of British colonialism upon the people of Palestine, or more broadly on other colonial subjects and spaces where a great deal of the wealth that built this country originated and was generated. Alternatively, coming from Jerusalem, the opposite somehow seems true. The legacy of British imperial decisions is also ever present, but only in its continuing political strife, while there is none of the wealth, splendor, and stability that we see here. I, of course, acknowledge that not everything is rosy here, but there are clear, stark differences between the two. There is, in fact, a perpetual feeling of conflict and gloom, and one that I must say is particularly profound after the last Israeli election results. Even the British consulate, as well as the British council, located both in East Jerusalem, some of them in Sheikh Jarrah, did not choose to recognize or speak to the fact that this is the centenary year of the British mandate. While such omissions might be understood, from a perspective of not wishing or not knowing how to address the thorns of the British colonial past and which affects a wide array of theaters, not only Palestine, together with the fear that this might open up a Pandora's box of legal and political questions and claims, the notion that the box of history can be ignored or closed indefinitely is fanciful. As an academic institution, we do not have such luxuries. To say nothing of what this means for shirking uncomfortable intellectual, political, and moral questions that remain outstanding today. Indeed, the box is already being opened up by others, while silences sometimes speak stronger than words. One of the reasons that this event is held today and not on November 2nd, which is the actual anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, is because a major international conference in Palestine studies was already being held at Bir Zayt University from the 31st of October to the 2nd of November. One that was co-organized by our organization as well as Palestine studies departments from SOAS, Exeter, Columbia University, Brown University, University of Toronto, in addition to the Institute of Palestine Studies. This conference featured 64 original papers and 16 panels on topics as diverse as the Victorian imagination, which informed the mandate period, as well as the pacification policies of the British mandate and military to crush Palestinian rebellion in the revolt of 36 to 39. As a conference co-organizer, as well as an attendee, I can assure you that the discipline of Palestine studies is quantitatively expanding and qualitatively deepening, incorporating the best and brightest from UK academies, as well as the occupied territories, Israel, the United States, and beyond. In fact, Bishara Domani, Professor Bishara Domani, who is the president of Bir Zayt University and formerly head of the Palestine Studies Center at Brown University, 
and a formidable Ottoman specialist in his own lab, had this to say in his opening remark to that conference. He says, let's not keep referring to it as the mandate period. This is a patronizing legal dis designation that camouflages a much more violent reality. British imperial conquest and colonization of Palestinians with a view to erasing them as a political community. He would add, and I would argue perhaps more importantly, the period between the two world wars in the Middle East was the cauldron that forged, among other things, the states, the national identities, the institutions and political movements, and the economic infrastructures and social formations of the Middle East as we know it today. The so-called mandate period in the Eastern Mediterranean is seen as sowing the seeds of all major future conflicts, from wars between states to civil wars, from patterns of political exclusion to structures of inequality, and so on. It is commonly believed that hardly an important 20th century development can be explained without going back to the interwar period. When I speak to the issue of opening the box of British colonial history, I do not do so with the intention to figure the well, even though my finger may be raised. I say these words as the director of a British organization that incorporates institutionally the British School of Archaeology, a seminal organization established by the Palestine Exploration Fund in 1919 and which trained archaeologists in Palestine that conducted some of the most important archaeological digs in Palestine's history, digs which laid the foundations of the collection in the Palestine Department of Antiquities, as well as digs which contributed to the narrative formation of the Holy Land, and how Christian and Jewish Zionist groupings incorporated this narrative into their religious practices, political movements, and sometimes colonial endeavors. That is not the entirety of the history of our organization by any means. Indeed, Kathleen Kenyon, who our organization is currently named after, is amongst the most accomplished archaeologists of the 20th century and is credited, amongst other things, with specifically pointing out the inconsistencies between the biblical narrative and the stratigraphic record. I do not have time to go into these discrepancies or contributions and we have come to listen to another lecture entirely. But the broader point is to emphasize that academic inquiry must know no bounds and must not fear engaging in uncomfortable questions with a commitment to transparency, integrity, goodwill, and perhaps a good dose of a strong heart. In this light, we're very pleased and invite to, to have invited Dr. Abu Sitta today to speak to the legacies of the Balfour Declaration because there is no Palestinian studies scholar more knowledgeable in this sphere and who can speak to this legacy so profoundly on an academic and personal level. I leave it to our chair to introduce our speaker but would like to take this opportunity to thank our co-organizers from Race Ed, uh, particularly Dr. Sha'ara Vadisaria as well as the other co-sponsoring elements at the University of Edinburgh and uh, the team uh, who put this together, including the security team, as well as our chair today. Uh, thank you for affording us the opportunity to hear these voices and for allowing this process to be engaged in collectively. To my knowledge, this is among the few times that a Palestinian scholar of this stature has had the opportunity to formally speak in an institution so closely entangled with the British colonial past. I look forward to an enriching lecture and engaged discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shira and Tofiq, for giving us the background to this event uh, and also indicating the context in which it's taking place. Uh, it, it, alongside other events clearly in many other universities and uh, other parts of the world. So can I take this opportunity to say thank you to you both for all the work that you've done uh, in terms of setting this up, perhaps particularly to Shira uh, as the local organiser, uh, and also of course to everybody else behind the scenes, the ticket checkers, 
the technical team, uh, the security team, everybody who has done a lot already to uh, get ready for this event. Thanks very much for uh, all of that. Now, by way of the background to this event, uh, this year, as the publicity made clear, is the centenary of the establishment under the League of Nations of the British Mandate in Palestine, on the 22nd of July, 1922. The context within which this happened is interesting. Indeed, a good question for a pub quiz, even for Middle East specialists, might be where was the British Mandate for Palestine established? And many people might think the answer to that is obvious. It must be Geneva, the home of the League of Nations. But it was not actually so. The correct answer is St. James's Palace in London, which is an interesting indication, perhaps, of how things were done uh, in those days. Now, granted the mandate was, uh, anyway, and that event marks, in a sense, as Taufik has reminded us, the culmination of a process which began five years earlier with the issuing of the Balfour Declaration, whose 105th anniversary uh, took place just last week. And many of us here today may remember the event which was arranged five years ago by the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies to mark the exact centenary of that event when uh, in the Playfair Library, Professor Noor Masalha of St. Mary's University in Twickenham, West London, spoke on powerful symbols and the British Zionist Alliance from Balfour to the Nakba, which was that year's uh, W.M. Watt uh, memorial lecture. Now it's very appropriate that these events are discussed in Edinburgh because of the obviously close involvement in them of Arthur James Balfour, Lord Balfour, whose picture we have over here. Firstly, because he was a local boy, born and buried uh, in the village of Whittingham, out in East Lothian, so just about 25 miles away from here. And secondly, because although he headed south for his education to Eton and to Trinity College, Cambridge, he remained closely involved in Scottish affairs, including through serving as Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh, a role which he fulfilled for almost 50 years, from 1891 to 1930. Sorry, my maths has gone wrong there. That's 40 years, isn't it? He is therefore our longest serving Chancellor and on that basis there is undoubtedly therefore a particular reason for the declaration and the subsequent granting of the mandate to be discussed and critically assessed here in Edinburgh and that is the reason for the genesis uh, of this particular uh, event. Now to help us do this, this kind of critical reflection on declaration and mandate, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome our speaker for this evening, Dr. Salman Abu Sita. Dr. Abu Sita was born in 1937 near Beersheba in what was then Mandate Palestine, but which in 1948, the year of the end of the mandate, in the process which Palestinians call the Nakba, the catastrophe, became part of the State of Israel. With his family, he therefore became a refugee, firstly to the Gaza Strip uh, and then to Cairo. And there, as part of the remarkable act of altruism by the government of Gamal Abdel Nasser in the 1950s, by which university education was made freely available to Palestinian refugees, he graduated from the University of Cairo in the Faculty of Engineering. From there, he continued to postgraduate studies, obtaining a degree, uh, not a degree, a doctorate uh, in civil engineering from University College London. From there, he went on to establish a very successful engineering firm in Kuwait, and it is from there that Dr. Abu Sitter has come to be with us today. So a very warm welcome, uh, Thank therefore. You. Thank you. Now, there are three reasons I want to suggest why Dr. Abu Sitta is particularly well qualified to address today's topic. Firstly, as someone born in 1937, 
as someone who therefore lived through the ending of the mandate and the Nakba. He has invaluable first-hand experience of what happened. And as with other terrible events of the 20th century, the value of this first-hand testimony is obviously incalculable. Secondly, because in 2016, he published an autobiography, Mapping My Return, a Palestinian memoir, which was published by the American University in Cairo Press. This was the lead book review in volume 16, number two, of the Journal of Holy Land and Palestine Studies, which is published here in Edinburgh by Edinburgh University Press. And the reviewer, Rosemary Saig of the American University of Beirut, commented that the majority of personal accounts of the Nakba focus on Galilee or central Palestine. Part of the value of Dr. Abu Sitte's testimony is therefore that it focuses on the story in the south and the rather different dynamic there. And thirdly, because alongside his work as an engineer, Dr. Abu Sitta has devoted his life to the amassing of geographical data about Palestine. What Rosemary Saig in her review describes as restorative cartography. Based on the study of maps, photographs, administrative records and memos from different periods before, during and after the British mandate and using libraries in Britain, France, Germany, Turkey, Egypt, the US, the UN and even from Israel with the help of sympathetic Israeli friends, <coughs> Dr. Abu Sitter has produced a formidably detailed account of what happened to individual villages and settlements during the British Mandate and in the subsequent decades. And this has been published in his Atlas for Palestine, of which a couple of copies are available for consultation here, uh, published by the Palestine Land Society uh, in 2010. It's on the basis of this work that Yuri Avnery, an Israeli writer and peace activist with Gush Shalom, the Bloc of Peace, who had a very interesting correspondence with Dr. Abu Sitta in Counterpunch in 2014, described him as the world's foremost expert on the Nakba. And it's very good news that the future of Dr. Abu Sitta's archive is now secure, it having been offered a home, a permanent home, at the American University of Beirut. It's a great pleasure, therefore, to welcome Dr. Abu Sitter to Edinburgh to help us reflect on an aspect of our own history. And we look forward very much on the occasion of the centenary of the establishment of the British Mandate in Palestine to hearing Dr. Salman Abu Sitter's address to Balfour. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So many thanks that I cannot count. Thank you very much, Professor Goddard, for the introduction and for chairing this meeting. Thank you to my friends, Shara and Tawfiq, who in the last 100 days have been working very hard to arrange this event. They have been navigating rough waters, but they arrived at the destination safely in spite of some noise here and there. Why I say that? Because truth must be told. Who is afraid of truth? Only the criminal and the guilty. So there should be no hesitation in hearing about the truth. I should also say thanks to the various departments in the University of Edinburgh who sponsored this event. Um, they have been mentioned in your talk and in the invitation event bride, so I'm not going to repeat that. But I'm going to thank people who are here today for coming. 
Some of you came from Edinburgh. Some took the train four hours to come from London. We have people here who came several hours from uh, Europe. Others took the plane 10 hours to fly here to be with us tonight. So I thank them all for being here tonight. Now let us turn to our friend Balfour. Lord Balfour, Arthur James Balfour. In honor of truth, memory and justice, I am addressing you, Lord Balfour. Shall I call you Lord Balfour? <laughs> we will have a long journey together, so I'll call you Arthur James. From now on, I'm going to call you Arthur. Arthur, I wish you didn't die in 1930. I really want you to be alive today and be judged before everybody in the world, now during your real life and during your imagined life. If you didn't die in 1930, you would be alive today and will be judged by people during your imagined life so that we can hear you, we can hear firsthand what they say about your deeds. But you'd be 176 years today. This is more than twice my age. I have a stake in this because the first half of your lifetime, you knew it, you lived it. So I can address you, and make you accountable for what you have done. But in the second half of your imagined life, I lived through it. And I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to spread the sheet of your deeds here at the University of Edinburgh, where, as you have said, you have been the Imperial Chancellor for 40 years. This is appropriate place to address you, but Arthur. You came from this blessed land, Scotland, from among free and proud people in Scotland. You also came from a distinguished family, but you went to London to be brought up as a loyal English colonial servant. You did well. Some people say you have been a failure. Others say you have been an opportunist. Nevertheless, you held many positions of power, so that makes you accountable to your deeds. It seems, Arthur, you didn't like the Jews. Um, at least you thought they should protect England, you should protect England from their influx when they wanted to come here at the beginning of the 20th century. They were mostly Russian citizens of the Russian Empire, although they were ac accused of being disloyal citizens, but they were citizens of the Russian Empire. They were attacked in their ghettos and enclaves by the Cossacks. Their homes were destroyed, their property looted, their women violated, their young men were killed at random. It was a terrible human experience for the Jews. They call this pogrom, pogrom. Remember that word, Balfour, pogrom. Pogrom, because it will come back to haunt you by another name in another place. Not the same events, but much more fierce, with phosphorus bombs, tanks, and aeroplanes. Not sporadic, but a doctrine of regular policy. Not for a few nights or weeks, but for 74 years, and still counting. You have a lot to do this, a lot to do with this, Balfour. Those poor Russian Jews wanted to escape from the pogroms to find a safe haven in England. You refused. You refused to let them in. You passed the 1905 Aliens Act to prevent them from coming to England. But they took revenge. They immigrated to the United States instead. 100 years later, their APEC organization has been a strong lobby in the United States politics. The sons of those 
Russian immigrants took higher positions from Kissinger to Blinken, and they became foreign minister, the same position like yours in England, but for the United States. Slide. But Palestine was another story. It has a strategic position, important for your imperial interests. It is the heart of the Arab world. It is needed to cut down this heart of the Arab world. In 1916, you were part of a big scheme to deceive the Arabs by telling them that they will be free from the Ottoman rule if they join you in pushing the Turks out of Arab provinces. They believed you, they believed you, and they fought with you. To confirm your promise, the Allied planes dropped leaflets in the Arab territory repeating your, your promises. At the very same time, when these promises were made, Arthur, your man, Mark Sykes, and a French diplomat called George Picot were huddled in a dark room, spreading the map of the Middle East between them. They were dividing the Arab pie between them. They were arguing about where the borders of Palestine would be from the borders of Syria and Lebanon. You were dividing the Arab pie. You, the British and French, were fighting over war spoils on the dead body of the Arab nation. At the same time, you were driven by Zionist ambitions who wanted to extract more land and more water in Palestine, provided there were no people in it. They would not be allowed to be there. They wanted empty Palestine. But it was not empty. It was rich and fertile. Next one. This is Palestine at the time, rich and fertile, with 1,200 towns and villages, with rich land, with history, over 4,500 years. Not many people in Europe can claim that. <laughs> but you, Arthur, the politician, befriended wealthy European Jews. They told you that if you gave them a foothold in Palestine, they would mobilize all the Jews in the world on Britain's side in the First World War. You knew, of course, or at least you should have known, this was a lie. For one thing, the Zionists at the time did not number more than 5,000. The new leader, their new leader, Haim Wiseman, told you the opposite. He told you that they were a world force to be reckoned with. You knew, you knew it was not true. The Jews in many countries were silent citizens of the countries of their birth and residence. You had in your government a witness to that, a British Jewish minister, Edwin Montague. He was dead against your policies. And he believed it was bad for the Jews as it would strip them from their nationalities in other countries. He called Zionism a mischievous political creed. That's what he said. But you were clever. You wanted to kill two birds with one stone. You wanted to get rid of the Jews and deny them entry to England. At the same time, you wanted to turn them into a useful force for your imperial interest to dismember the Arab nation. Your prime goal at the time was the Suez Canal. As a scheming politician, Arthur, you arrived at an agreement with wealthy European Jews to that effect and kept it hidden in your drawer until the right time came. In preparation for this day, a Zionist British Jew, a cabinet minister, Herbert Samuel, submitted a memorandum in 1915 entitled The Future of Palestine. It was a plan to colonize Palestine. In the same year, British threat to Ottoman rule Palestine became ominous. They planned to attack Palestine from their base in Egypt. My father, 
was against the British and on the side of the Ottomans, on the basis that they were Muslim rulers for Muslim lands. He, that's my father, accompanied his uncle Suleiman, who was a leader of 1,500 horsemen from Beersheba to fight the British garrison at the Suez Canal. My father saw his uncle in battle, galloping in his horse, waving his sword before he was gunned down by machine guns of the British. The right time for you to reveal your secret agreement with the Jews took a little longer than you expected. Why? Because in January 1917, British forces entered Palestine uh, from their base in Egypt. The British had a hard time occupying Palestine. They were defeated at the gates of Gaza twice. Well, obviously, Gaza has a history of resistance. The British lost thousands killed and more um, uh, wounded soldiers from, their soldiers came from various parts of the British Empire. It took them six months, the British, to lick their wounds and regroup. A new commander of the British forces was appointed. His name was General Alimbi. To recover from their defeat in Gaza, the British devised a new attack plan to pretend they attacked Gaza for the third time, but actually they wanted, wanted to attack Beersheba in the east instead of that. My family knew this. The British forces, next one, the British forces started from my land. This is a First World War map, and it says we left from Abu Sita land, right? And then they proceeded to Beersheba from the east. And this ruse, this new attack, um, succeeded. The British marched all light along this red line and attacked Beersheba unexpectedly from the east. Why I'm telling you this, Balfour? Because it shows how and when you made your declaration. At 7 p.m. on Wednesday, 31st of October, 1917, the British forces took Beersheba. That was the first British uh, victory in the First World War. They had defeats in Gaza, as I said, twice. They had defeats in Kut in Iraq, and they had defeats in Gallipoli in Turkey. So the next morning, which is 1st of November, LMB sent a telegram to London saying, Beersheba is in our hands. Jerusalem will be your Christmas present. On the second day of November, you, Arthur, received a LMB telegram and you pulled out of your drawer a piece of paper you already signed with the, with the Jews and made your declaration, Balfour Declaration. Before that, you could not do that. Now, I don't need to recite for you the Balfour Declaration. It's very clear. It was, of course, 105 years ago, today, this, this week. Your declaration was the promise of those who did not own to those who have no title, giving away the property of the absent lawful, on, lawful owner. Arthur, in today's world, what you have done will take you to jail because you issued a false promissory note. <laughs> but the fraud of giving a title deed of a stolen property to foreigners was covered by the casual reference to the owners, we, the owners. The national majority of Palestine, 95% of the population. You did not mention them by name. You called them, you alluded to them, the others, the non-Jews. We were the non-Jews, 95%. There's no point in picking, or being picky about the details of the, 90, the 67 word uh, infamous document, uh, such as using the word home for Jews, when you actually meant a state, uh, such as saying that 
to be in Palestine, where you intended to be of all Palestine. But however treacherous this document, you're not ashamed of it. You justified it by saying, plainly saying this, for in Palestine, we do not propose even to go through the form of consulting the wishes, he did not say the rights, the wishes of the present population of the country. Who, who were this population? Who were this population? You described them, described them, described us as wholly barbarous, undeveloped, and unorganized black tribes. This is what you described us, Arthur. Well, again, today this is a racist mark. We could take you to court. But um, as he promised, uh, General Allenby took Jerusalem barely one month after your um, declaration. The news of Allenby taking Jerusalem was hailed in the newspaper. The headline says, Jerusalem is rescued <laughs> by the British after 673 years of Muslim rule. Rescued. The newspaper said, great rejoicing in the Christian world. And below that, Jews everywhere see the restoration of Palestine. The irony is, the word restoration is really against the Jews because it was a code word in the 19th century uh, to get rid of the Jews by restoring them to Palestine. So it was not a compliment. The newspaper figure of 603, seven years of Muslim rule is obviously wrong. It is 300, uh, 1300 years. Yet the figure of 637 is relevant. It is the year when Omar ibn Khattab entered Jerusalem. He offered the population of Jerusalem the Omariya covenant to assure them of peace and brotherhood. Unlike you, Arthur, unlike you, Omar did not come to destroy the people or replace them. He came to make them his brothers. Arthur, you wanted to give credence to the, your declaration and also the Jews wanted more formal recognition uh, of your declaration. So you pass your declaration um, to the League of Nations, as you said, in July 1922. This year is its centenary. What is this League of Nations which adopted that and endorsed it? It was only you. It was only you and a handful of um, other colonial uh, countries in Europe. The rest of the world was absent in the League of Nations. But the League had lofty ideas to justify its colonization. Article 22 of the League of Nations Charter proclaimed that it had a duty under sacred trust of civilization to bring freedom and independence to the freed Arab provinces. Sacred trust of civilization. I ask you, Arthur, is giving away Palestine to foreigners a sacred trust of civilization? Do you have an answer to that? Could you, if you are alive? But does this map tell you that it is an empty land to give away? Does the, this map tell you that Palestine is an empty land? All the brown color is Arab, and the blue is uh, the Jews who were there at the time. But in 1920, 30 years after your declaration, you entrusted the administration of Palestine to a Zionist Jew by the name of Herbert Samuel, the same person who a few years back presented a paper to colonize Palestine. His mission was to implement the Zionist policy of taking over Palestine under the protection of your declaration. Arthur, by this time you were 75, so you must be frail by this time. But you left the helm to a younger English colonial officer. He was a thoroughbred imperialist, a racist of the first order. His name was 
Winston Churchill. <laughs> he followed your footsteps. When the House of Lords rejected your declaration by two-thirds majority, Churchill, the orator, was a very good orator, gave a resounding speech, speech reminding the members that your declaration is good for British imperial interests. And he won. Like you, Churchill found Zionism and Jews useful for the purpose. He, like you, derided the Arabs and scoffed at the British promises for their liberation and independence. But for Palestinians, Churchill had a special, special word for him. He dismissed their historical bond of their country altogether. Dripping with racism, Churchill said of the Palestinian right in their country this, I don't agree that the dog in the manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I don't admit that right to the dog. That's what I said about the Palestinian right in their country. We were like a dog in a manger. He doesn't own the manger. Well, that's the kind of man who followed your policy. His protege, Herbert Samuel, ran into the difficulty in the first year of administration in Palestine. <coughs> I live through the correspondence between Churchill and, and uh, Samuel in the British archives. Reading that is astounding. Palestinians are protesting against the Bolsheviks, the Russian Jews, landing in Jaffa. Arabs and Jews are killed and wounded. Samuel sent a telegram to Churchill. Churchill replied, tell them we are sending a commission of inquiry. <coughs> Someone says again, they want parliamentary representation in their country. Don't mention the word representation. They are still the majority, came the reply from Churchill. Um, and naturally, the Palestinians revolted against that. Churchill arrived in Palestine in the spring of 1921 to help Samuel. He met an assembly of Palestine dignitaries in Jerusalem, pacifying them, assuring them of Britain's honorable intentions. My father was one of them. My father told me that Churchill told him, assured him personally, that Britain respected and affirmed their rights in Beersheba district, their land and traditional customs. Churchill uh, told him, asked him, to resort to peace and don't raise a rebellion against the British. His statement, Churchill's statement to my father, was confirmed by an official document from the government, British government. This document was brought before an Israeli court many years later in 2010. A Palestinian citizen of Israel in Beersheba, his name is Nuri al uqbi protesting Israel's confiscation of his land in Beersheba, presented this document. The Israeli court dismissed it on the grounds that Beersheba was empty of land. Nobody lived there. Here you have that. But with support from Churchill, Samuel resumed his mission. In his five years of tenure, from 1920 to 1925, he promulgated about 100 laws, essentially founding Israel, waiting to be announced 28 years later. Samuel created separate Jewish institutions for education, for banking, for power generation, for public works, and particularly a Jewish Legislative Council, and embryonic Jewish army, the Haganah. The Palestinians, the majority, 95%, were denied the right to do any of these things. In 1925, you, Arthur, entered Palestine for the first time. You attended the inauguration of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, wearing the University of Edinburgh robes. 
while you were honored by grateful Jews, you did not hear the shouts and curses of Palestinians just outside denouncing you in Jerusalem and as far as away as Damascus. Nor did it occur to you that the word Hebrew, which is a language word, was a hidden word for Israel. In fulfillment of your declaration, Palestine do doors were now open to the influx of European Jewish settlers. In a August 1929, the Russian settlers, the Bolsheviks, attempted to talk, take over the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. This ignited the great Palestinian rebellion, which started three years. Arthur, you must have heard about the Burak uprising in your final days. You must have heard about the British Commission, yet another commission, sent to investigate. In March 1930, you, lost our, you left our world. Arthur, I wish you had remained alive to see what happened next and the suffering and all the death and destruction which is caused by you. But I shall tell you what happened after that. That's why I come here today to haunt you and to bring your deeds to the notice of the whole world. By 1930, the number of uh, Jewish European settlers, the Bolsheviks, climbed to 30% of the population of the country. Naturally, the, population, the Palestinian population rose against the threat to their existence of the country. The rebellion was met with utmost British brutality. Utmost British brutality. The RAF bombed villages indiscriminately. People saw airplanes dropping bombs in the, on them for the first time in history. British forces attacked the villages, destroyed their supplies, and um, held the men captive in cages for two days on end without food and water. The art of British torture was refined. They forced villagers to walk barefoot on the thorns of subbar tree. Collective punishment was applied widely. Political parties were dissolved. Political parties were dissolved and the leaders were executed, imprisoned, or deported. The British executed the 80-year-old man, leader of the revolt, Sheikh Farhan Saadi. He was 80 years old and he was hanged while fasting in Ramadan on 22nd of November, 1937. That's the date of my birth. <coughs> Meanwhile, the British forces trained the Jewish militia, created elite units known as SNS, Special Night Squads, gave them uniforms, shared intelligence with them. The British helped create the Haganah, the future army of Israel. The British brutality was copied and greatly refined by Israel today. But the Palestinians resisted as much as they could. They have tiny means. In each village, a dozen or two young people joined the fighters in the uprising. I know this personally. My brother, Abdullah, led the revolt in Beersheba district. With his com comrades, they kicked the British out of the district for one year and they set up a national government from 1938 to 1939. But what could they do against the might of the British Empire? The minimum estimate of Palestinian casualties was 5,000 killed, 15,000 wounded, and probably 15,000 or more were jailed. This is about 50% of all adult population in the place where the revolt was, 50%. They were either wounded or jailed by the British. That's why I always say, and will continue to say, 1939 is the British inflicted Nakba on Palestine. Six years later, in 1945, your country emerged from the Second World War victorious, but very much exhausted. And those Jewish settlers you brought to my country decided they don't need you anymore. They wanted to get rid of you. 
They wanted to take over Palestine for themselves. They carried out a series of terrorist acts against you, against your people and your British forces. You, their erstwhile benefactor. They hanged your soldiers in trees. They blew up your buildings and they kidnapped your judges. But you tolerated them so much, very unlike what you have done to us. You saw them invading Palestine in April 1948. You did nothing. The settler army you helped build started the invasion of Palestine while the British were watching. Here, I give you a slide many people have not seen before. Now, next one. This is a map. I hope some people saw this. This is a map of Palestine in 1948. All the red areas you see there are Palestinian lands occupied by the Haganah before Israel was declared, before the British left, before any Arab regular soldier came to Palestine. All the blue dots are villages which have been depopulated and many of them had massacres. In the squares, the name of the brigade uh, which did that. In, in, uh, they have 120,000 soldiers in nine brigades. They carried out 31 military operations and they invaded Palestine mostly uh, the, during and under the British rule, when Palestine were under the British rule. Half of the refugees of Palestinians were expelled while the British were watching. No, um, in, Ap in April, you, you, you watch the 156 massacres in this period and you did nothing. Deir Yassin is one of them. More than that, in the same date, in April 1948, David Ben-Gurion started a new kind of war. It's called biological war to pollute water resources of villages and towns with typhoid. I wrote about this 20 years ago. Nobody took notice. Last month, Benny Morris wrote about it. Everybody took notice. <laughs> we knew that firsthand. I wrote a document, as I said, 20 years ago. Um, the Haganah attacked us while you are watching. Your British forces were watching. They attacked and depopulated 12 major cities in Palestine and 220 villages uh, where massacres were committed while your forces were watching. No, sometimes the British forces help the Haganah to expel people from Tiberias and from Haifa and, and other places. Your British forces failed to protect us against massacres such as in Deir Yassin, Ain Zaytun, Sa'asa, Hunin, Musar Mansur al Khayyat, Husiniya, and many others. Shamelessly, British forces failed to stop the depopulation of our main cities in Jaffa, Haifa, Safad, and Tiberias. Half of all Palestinian refugees were expelled by the Haganah while the Palestine was under the protection of the British forces. In April 1948, the last British civil servant rushed to leave Lidda in airport, Lidda airport, in panic to catch the last civil plane out of Palestine. History has no mercy. The same scene has been repeated by the Americans in Vietnam in 1975 and in Kabul only last year. They rushed nervously, hurriedly to the last plane to take them out of the country, leaving the people in devastation. But there is nothing more indicative of this disgrace than the sight of Alan Cunningham, Alan Cunningham, the last High Commissioner of Palestine leaving Palestine. He left Palestine in a small boat with a British flag fluttering at its tail with no one saying goodbye to him, neither from the betrayed Palestinians nor from the winning Jews. Arthur you owe Cunningham a big apology. But on 14th of May, 1948, David Ben-Gurion was busy. 
he addressed the Jewish Settlers Council and declared his state Palestine for the first time. On the same day, 14 May, the Jewish militia, the Haganah, the army you trade, attacked us, attacked my land in Al Ma'in. It's the same place, they attacked the same place you see in the map called Abu Sitta. The Jews came in a force to my place, my birthplace, in 24 armored vehicles. We had about 10, maybe 15 rifles. 24 armored vehicles. They killed anyone they saw. They blew up and burnt every building and structure. They blew up my school, which my father built in 1920. They blew up our mill, where we you know, make flour from wheat. They killed, they destroyed everything in sight. I saw all this. I'm an eyewitness to that. I was hiding in a ravine with women and children. I saw the smoldering remains, the debris and the ashes. I saw that, I saw that. And so, on that same day, I became a refugee. I have been a refugee for 27,207 days. I shall never forgive you, Arthur, for this. The Nakba occurred. The Nakba shows, is shown here briefly. These red dots are Palestinian villages which have been depopulated by a series of massacres. Next. They were all expelled. And so Palestine became empty as the myth says it. The myth says Palestine empty land. It was, was a plan to make it empty. The plan was to make it empty. So it became empty. What happened to the people of these villages? They became Next, they became refugees in these refugee camps. Well, these are al Nakba huge dimensions. The population, the population of 560 Palestinian cities and villages, the entire destruction of people who lived there for 4,500 years. And th this was done by invasion of a foreign invasion to Palestine. So the remedy comes naturally. What to do? Of course, the natural remedy is to stop this crime and to store the refugees back to their homes. And that's what we call right of return, which we will never give up. The Arabs, other Arab countries, failed to save Palestinians in the first round. They should have tried again to erase the consequences of this Nakba. So you should, your government should encourage them to do so or help them to do so. You should help them to do so. You are the cause of all this. It's natural that you should help them. But your government reaction was just the opposite. In 1950, a Britain ganged up with France and the United States and issued the Tripartite Re Declaration, warning the Arabs against any attempt to reverse this Nakba. They actually ganged up against any attempt to restore people back to their homes. So then, where is the next war? Who waged the next war? It was Britain led by, by the unstable Eden in collusion with France and Israel. They attacked Egypt in, 19, in 1956 to topple Nasser, but the result was different. Eden vanished out of the political scene, and Nasser uh, became one of the world, three world leaders of the non-aligned countries, representing three quarters of the world population. In 1967, Israel attacked again. It occupied the remainder of Palestine, uh, now called the West Bank and Gaza, occupied Sinai um, and Egypt and the Golan in Syria and later South Lebanon. This occupation is now 55 years old. So every day since then, 
the blood of Palestinian people is spilled. Children and women are killed. Houses are demolished. Thousands are jailed. Travel to families, schools, and hospitals are restricted. Just see, by the way, students can see, very fresh report by Francisca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur in Human Rights. It just came back. It's, you look at also Amnesty International report. It's the most detailed documented document. You students, don't miss it. Don't miss it. So, Arthur, your legacy continues through your successors. Theresa May addressed Jews on your centenary 100 years by recalling your declaration with pride. She says this pride. Then you have the prime minister with the unruly hair, Boris Johnson. He de de declared himself to be a passionate Zionist. Now, of course, recently we have the new comer, Elizabeth Truss, who stated she is a huge Zionist. A huge, I don't know what I mean by a huge Zionist. <laughs> Um, but the British people told her to get out after 44 <laughs> days. Yeah. Add to this list the murderous legacy of the departed Ben-Gurion, Rabin, Sharon, and now Gantz, the Israeli war minister who's in office now. He's now wanted by the International Criminal Court in The Hague, by the way. Um, so um, now, the last word we get yesterday from news, Israel elected a most racist government, some call it fascist government, and therefore they have just publicly declared their colors. We don't have to explain. They explained who they are. But such a long criminal record is mired in the mud of your legacy, Arthur. We never lose hope as much as we don't ever lose our right of return to home, but we also do not lose hope. There remains a righteous people among the British people. Over recent years, um, they created a large constituency of support for Palestinian rights. It is growing every day. Many are here today, and I am proud to know many of them and work with them. So here it is, Arthur. Arthur James Balfour. These pages of your legacy before your eyes. And then I tell you, you have eternity to think about it, to regret it, and to be punished for it. We Palestinians lived in our country for thousands of years, before and during the invasion of many countries. I, for one, document my lineage in Palestine for 200 years. This document, dated 1845, shows the name of my great, great, great grandfather, Sheikh Dahshan Abu Sitta. Um, and he lived there in his country long before the settlers from the cold hills of Russia smuggled into my country, pretending to be the original Palestinians, and I'm not the original Palestinian. The date of this document here, as, uh, as I say, 1845. It is almost the same date, next, almost the same date, 1848. The birth date, your birth date, your birth date. You were born at Wijingham, right? Wijingham. Wijingham House, East Luthien, in, in Scotland in 1848. The irony is still with us. Add 100 years to this date, you get 1948 and Nakba. Your birth was the harbinger of death and destruction. The Holy Land became land of blood, destitution, and grave for humanity. 100 years later, from your birth, the Nakba occurred. 100 years later. So Palestine was destroyed. Palestinians were depopulated and we became refugees. Nevertheless, the Palestinians are still here. It's true, we are occupied, attacked, wounded, vilified, forsaken, but still alive and defiant. 
We were 700,000 when your fam infamous declaration was made. Now we are 14 million in and around Palestine and scattered around the world. Do you recall your statement, holy barbarous and developed and unorganized black tribes? You remember that statement about us? Well, if you lived in our world today, you would know about Edward Said, uh, Ismail Shammut, Ghassan Kanafani, Najil Ali, and thousands of freedom fighters, known or silent heroes, defending our country. You would know about Naif brothers, children of a small farmer in Palestine. Now they are top scientists in the United States. Or you know about Sam Daly. He is one of the top 2% of world scientists today, a friend of mine. You would know about the young man from Gaza refugee camp who designed the helicopter which landed on the moon. And the women, the women you used to see carrying jars of water in their heads, walking from the spring to home. Do you know what happened to them? I'll tell you what happened to them. Today, you would meet Samah Sabawi, the playwright in Australia. Susan Abul Hawa, the novelist with books in 30 languages. Noor Ariqat, the eloquent human rights lawyer. Sami Halabi, the painter, the renowned painter. And to top it all, Arthur, there is a new name for you, Nujud Fahum, young woman, planned to be the first woman on the moon. On the moon, Arthur. <laughs> well, these are the people you made refugees. These are the people you made. But in spite of you and your wicked promise, in spite of the crimes committed and are being committed today based on it, we still believe, Palestinians, we still believe that justice will prevail. Justice will triumph. We look at the free and liberated future Palestine with the help of good people and they are the majority. Today, in front of this noble assembly, I remind you of the words of Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Very simple rule. If you are silent on situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. But I'm sure you will not be silent. That's why you are here tonight. But only the criminal is afraid of truth. Only the criminal who want you not to hear what we are talking about. Therefore, I ask you to join me on this call. We call on the British government to apologize to the Palestinian people for the suffering, to support the implementation of the inalienable right of return of Palestinians to their homes, to pay full compensation for losses and damages, to help in the rebuilding of the new Palestine and the re repatriation of its people, to teach the true Palestinian history in schools and in the media. And all the above, and all the above, we call on you present here today to stand by these demands and to restore Palestine to its people in justice and freedom as LMB found it in 1917, and to liberate Palestine from all the ills of humanity, Zionism, racism, apartheid, occupation, and war crime. Let Palestine be free from the river to the sea. Thank you.